Another very powerful planning technique that we talk an awful lot about is what's called cost segregation. Cost segregation is a technique to accelerate depreciation on, on real estate. And you can save an awful lot of money. And with that tax savings, you can reinvest it into additional real estate. And that's how you build a portfolio. You can grow your portfolio using cost segregation. Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rear view mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this. And it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school. And accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more, so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. I find that many business owners don't understand the different roles of bookkeepers, tax planners, and tax preparation people, and that they are all different skill sets. And you need to be sure that you are picking the right person for the right role. We'll cover that and some great tax planning tips today. Gary Massey is founder of Massey & Company CPA based in Atlanta. He's got 30 years of experience in tax prep, tax planning, and dealing with the IRS in problems. Let's meet him and see what we can learn. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Gary Massey. Thank you, Rocky. It's good to be here. And I'm excited to learn from you. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Absolutely. So my name is Gary Massey, and I am a CPA. I've been doing this for about 30 years or so. And I have a firm based in Atlanta. And we serve clients throughout Georgia and throughout the United States. We are a growing firm and we focus on the needs of small businesses and small business owners. Our focus is tax return preparation, tax planning, tax representation, which means solving tax problems for our clients, whether the problem is related to the IRS or to the State Department of Revenue. It could be an income tax issue or a sales tax issue, for example. And we also do accounting and bookkeeping for our business clients. So pretty much full service then? Yes. Yeah. But we, we're a Let's, boutique firm. We, we have about 12 people on staff. And uh, a lot of us are now remote after, after COVID. And as I said, we serve clients throughout the United States. So I want to talk about one thing, because I think a lot of people get this confused. The difference between tax preparation and tax planning. Because I'm constantly hearing complaints. Well, my CPA doesn't tell me how to lower taxes. I'm like, well, you didn't hire somebody to do that. <laughs> right. So tax planning is a proactive activity. In other words, it's, it's looking forward. So right now we are recording this December 5th of 2023. There are still things to be done before the end of 2023. And if people listen to this in 24, there are things to be done then. So there's, there's always something to be done going forward when you're doing tax planning. Once you get to the return, that's a backward activity. That's for the prior year. 
And when you get to that point, there's a limit as to how much you can do when the year closes. So uh, that's the main difference, I would say, between planning and preparation. And I will say, starting in October, depending on the client, we start having conversations about, hey, pick up the phone and call your CPA or your tax person. What do we need to do between now and the end of the year? I don't want it to be a rush. I want it to be planned. What do we need to think about in order to help you reduce taxes? But I also like to do appropriate tax planning instead of just wasting money, which is what so many people do. And so it's a big uh, a big push for that. So let's talk about that. What are some great ideas for tax planning where the business owner gets to essentially keep the money or at least not just waste it on something they don't need just to get a tax deduction? Well, there's, there's so much to be done, especially for people who own a business. And owning a business includes owning an operating business, whether you're an electrician or a plumber or an accountant or, or consultant or whatever. Those are all operating businesses. Also, there's, there's real estate. Real estate is a business and it brings with it a tremendous amount of tax savings, tax planning and tax savings opportunities. So those are both areas of, of what I would call owning a business and they bring with them opportunities for tax planning. People who don't have that, who are just employees, it's much more difficult for an employee to do tax planning. There are opportunities, but the opportunities are not quite as common. Okay. This particular conversation, I think we're really talking to business owners, right? So we're going to focus on business listeners. owners. Yeah. Okay. Our so listeners we're focus are all on business, business owners. owners. So I will give you an example of something which I did myself, which I think was very, very powerful. So I have an S corporation, which I recommend for, for many of our clients. It's very, it's very powerful. So with an S corporation, however, there's one, there's one important requirement. Is called reasonable compensation. You have to pay yourself through payroll a reasonable amount of money. And that's reasonable is defined as if you were to go out and hire someone like, like yourself, how much would you pay them? But you, you consider it's like you, you have to look at all the, all the hats that, that the person wears. They not only manage the company, but they, they perhaps take out the trash and they vacuum and they do bookkeeping and they do administration and all the different things. So you add all of it together and you figure out what reasonable compensation is. And if the IRS ever audits you, that's what they're going to be looking for. It's one of the key things in an audit of an S corporation is reasonable compensation. However, and there's an incentive for all of us as business owners to keep that number as low as possible in order to minimize payroll taxes. Okay. On the other hand, all of us have an important tax planning or financial planning uh, incentive, and that's retirement planning. We want to be able to put money into our, into our retirement plans, whether you have a 401k or a, or, a, or a SEP or a pension or something like that. And the number that you can put into your retirement plan is generally a function of payroll. So you want your payroll to be high enough so that you can fund your retirement, but yet you want it to be not, not too high so you don't pay too much tax. So. I call that the sweet spot. So we try to identify the, the, the sweet spot in terms of minimizing taxes and maximizing retirement plan contributions. Can you not put money from draws into a retirement plan then? So you could, you could take out money from, from draws. Yes, you, you could do that, but that's not what we're talking about because, because, uh, draws themselves are not taxable or tax deductible. You already pay tax on that. That's not a tax deduction. So let me rephrase that. If a, let's just say I have an S corp and I get a hundred thousand dollars in salary and I get a hundred thousand dollars in a distribution on my K one, because that was the other part of the profit of the business. Does that second hundred thousand then qualify for retirement planning or is it only the salary portion? Well, it's coming out of the salary. There's a percentage that you can put in into your retirement plan. It's based on the salary, which are your W-2 wages. W-2 wages are subject to social security taxes. It's about 15, I forget the exact number, something like 15.2% or something similar to that. 
So if you keep that number lower, you're going to save on Social Security tax. However, you can't put as much into your retirement plan. So what I did myself, in cooperation with a with a with a good um, financial planner, is we we did a calculation as to what I'm going to need for my retirement, how much I have to put in, and we set the wage amount so it would be at a minimum satisfactory to the IRS. That's called reasonable compensation. And at a maximum, it would give me what I need for my retirement. So this is where the financial planner and the CPA work together. And it's one of the most powerful tax planning concepts because you could really set aside an awful lot from your income into a retirement plan. And that can be your, your retirement. And that's something that, that all of us need to, need to be aware of. And I know you're not an attorney, but I would think if, depending on what state you're in, if you're putting money into a retirement plan, even if your business goes belly up and bankrupt, more often than not, they can't touch the retirement plan. So you're somewhat protected. Usually not. Usually not. Usually not. Right, right. And so that's a very powerful idea. But there's a lot you can do. Anybody who has either real estate or has an operating business can do a lot of tax planning. When, when it comes, to, we're t- just to conclude on the matter about um, payroll and about reasonable compensation. So right now we're in December. We're, we're recording this December the 5th. So we're sending out letters today to all of our clients and our corporations to make sure that they pay themselves enough, both to satisfy the IRS and to be able to fund their retirement plan. For the, for the current year, for 2023. So, th- and this is an evergreen idea. It goes year after year, but it's very powerful. There are other things you could do. For example, I was speaking with another client today and I said, you know, we're at the end of December. If you need a computer, you may want to buy it now rather than waiting until the following year. So there's a lot of things like that, that, that you can do. Another very powerful planning technique that we talk an awful lot about is what's called cost segregation. Cost segregation is a technique to accelerate depreciation on on real estate. And you can save an awful lot of money. And with that tax savings, you can reinvest it into additional real estate. And that's how you build a portfolio. You can grow your portfolio using cost segregation. Some of the other ones I know of, paying your kids. Yes. Very good idea. Very good idea. You're allowed to have corporate meetings, right? Even in the Caribbean. Yes, that's right. That's that's one of my favorite ideas. If you if you if you have a board of directors, you can have the meeting wherever you want. Just make sure that you keep records of, of what you talked about, and why they're there, what what the business purpose of that meeting is, and then you can do that. Absolutely. Hiring the kids or hiring any family member is a great idea to be transferring money whether it's to someone you want to support within your family, like like uh, one of your uncles or whatever, your unfortunate cousin who has having troubles, you can do that. It's a way of transferring money with a tax deduction. Or, as, as I always say, I think it's a great way to, to teach kids about entrepreneurship and fiscal responsibility. Give them something to do. If it's a legitimate business activity, even if it's copying or answering the phones or shredding papers or whatever, it doesn't matter. It teaches them. And I think that's just a a great activity for a family. You can also fund the kids' Roth IRAs then. So you're teaching them how to save. That's right. Delayed gratification. Never pay tax on that money ever. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely correct. What are some other creative ways we can do some tax planning? Well, we spoke about the 401k. Holiday parties are all tax deductible. Board of Directors meetings, we talked about cost segregation, um, home office is, is a great idea. We, there's something called an accountable plan. You can reimburse, you can have your company reimburse you for your home office and for other aspects of your home, your insurance, your utilities, and so on. And that's all tax deductible. So it's a, it's a great way. Um, telephone, your cell phone, there's tons of things you can do that become deductible when you have a business, whether it's real estate or whether it's an active business, all those things become tax deductible. It's just shifting, shifting from personal to business. And I really love the Augusta rule where if you're holding company meetings, your company rents the building from you, you don't pay taxes, they get a deduction. 
So that's another nice one that, that is out there. Again, you have to do it appropriately. These things all need to be done appropriately and planned. And you need to have the conversations with whoever's doing your tax prep to make sure that they're okay with these as well. And they tell you what the little intricacies are. And all of the ideas that we're talking about in this conversation, these are all legitimate tax planning ideas. They're not risky. They're not especially risky. As long as you can look your IRS agent in the eye and say, this is what you did, and you have the records to back it up, you have the receipts, this is all good stuff. There's nothing here that we're, we're talking about that's particularly risky or troublesome. You're entitled to use these ideas. Also, there's entity choice. We haven't really talked about that. If you're starting a business, should you be a sole proprietorship? Generally not. Or should you have an LLC? Usually that's a good idea. Set up an LLC. If you own property, put it into an LLC. Why do you do that? It doesn't save on taxes, but it protects you in case of a lawsuit. They can only sue what's in your LLC. They can't go after all of your other assets. I spoke with an attorney today, in fact, and I, I asked this attorney the question, what happens if you own a piece of property personally and you want to move it into an LLC? What do you do? So you can do it with a what's called a quick claim deed. You have to be careful if there's a mortgage on the property because if you transfer it into the LLC and there's a mortgage, it's considered a change in ownership. There are things you have to do about that that's important. I'm told the banks don't look. So it's it's a technicality. I'm it's not a technicality. It, it is it's a technicality, it's a technicality, but you have to technicality. check. You have to check. Yes. Ideally, put it in an LLC, put your property into an LLC. And then there are mm-hmm. S corporations, partnerships, all kinds of this is all entity choice. And it's again, it's very powerful. The other issue you have, depending on the state, if they collect uh, a real estate like stamp tax, if you move it from personal to LLC, you may have yes. to pay yes. that transfer tax when when you do that. And so that's always the case. So let's flip to the opposite side because you help people when they get in trouble with the IRS. What usually causes people to get in trouble with the IRS and how do we prevent that? Beautiful question. So there, there are a couple ways of looking at it. One is that you don't want to be audited. Okay. So what gets a person audited? There are a couple things. If you have an expense that is out of the norm, out of the average, that increases your chances of being audited. You're entitled to duck whatever's a legitimate business expense. Nothing wrong with that as long as you can prove it, but you may get audited if you have an unusually high expense. For example, let's say your charitable contributions are unusually high relative to your income. That could trigger an audit. Or if you have a business expense, like let's say uh, advertising, your advertising expense, which is a legitimate business expense, is high relative to your earnings from the business. But we don't know exactly what those numbers are, what's considered normal, but we have a sense of what's normal. I have a sense of what's normal. Question. Most businesses don't get credit for charitable donations, correct? It would flow to your personal return? Correct. When I mentioned charitable, that was in reference to an individual, and an individual being audited. On the business side, we're talk- more talking about business expenses. A very, And of course, some areas are riskier than others. Business side, meals and entertainment, or meals are a high-risk area because they, they tend to be an area where people abuse. It's an abusive area. So you have to be careful. If you do have business meals, make sure you have receipts. And on the receipt, write down who you had the meal with and what the business purpose is, what you discussed. And as long as you can pull out those receipts, you'll be fine. Either keep them in, in a folder, or better yet, take a picture with your cell phone and save them somewhere. You can download it into QuickBooks or save it into into some kind of file, electronic file, and, that, and just keep that. And that's the best thing to do. So that's on the audit side. Another area which comes up a lot is when people can't pay their taxes. You know, it's time to prepare the return and you have your accountant, your CPA, your preparer, or you do it yourself. And you see, oh my God, I owe a lot of money and I can't pay for it. So what are you going to do? File the return anyway, even if you can't pay the bill. 
you minimize penalties. As long as you file the return, you're not going to have a penalty for a late filing. You're going to owe money, but you're not going to have a penalty for a late filing. So get the return filed, and then is the time to start negotiating with the IRS. There are several tools that the IRS allows that we take advantage of to negotiate with the IRS on behalf of our clients. For example, you can get into an installment agreement where you pay it over many years, over six or seven, eight years or so. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. And we negotiate installment agreements for our clients all the time. Another thing is the offer and compromise where you make a deal with the IRS. But the one, there's one very important requirement for all of these things, all of these deals and negotiations. You have to be in compliance with the IRS. You have to have filed returns. If you haven't filed returns in five years, which happens all the time, you're not going to be able to negotiate. You have to get caught up. People call me all the time with unfiled returns. They haven't filed in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, and so on. It happens all the time. So when you get them caught up, they're going to owe a bunch of taxes, but you can negotiate once the returns have been filed. So that's what, what we do. And then the other thing I would say on this whole subject is when you get a letter from the IRS, when the letter comes in the mail, make sure that you open it. A lot of people take their mail from the government and put it into a drawer because they're whatever, they're afraid or they're uncomfortable or they're scared, whatever it is. Open it up and deal with it. Generally, the government is going to work with you as long as you are cooperative. Unless you're cooperative, you're cooperating and you are responsive. If you do that, you'll, you'll be okay. Getting back just before we got to this, uh, I wanted to make a comment on charitable donations. Because charitable donations are not deductible to the business, a lot of times we advise business owners, rather than making charitable donations, by advertising. So your local church, you could buy advertising in the bulletin versus sure, giving yeah, a donation. And now it shifts to a fully deductible expense. Same thing with your kids' little league, right? Buy advertising on the back of the shirts. Hey, A, you get advertising that kids wear and everywhere, and now you get a tax deduction instead of just giving money away. Because even if it goes to your personal return, it doesn't always become tax deductible. Because if you don't hit the, the limits and do all well, there's a million rules. It, it doesn't matter. But the, the point is that. The other thing I want to talk about is the power of bookkeeping for tax preparation. Because if you don't have good bookkeeping or your bookkeeping isn't properly categorizing things and it's saying, oh, that was a draw to you or this or that, or you didn't capture the expense, it then becomes profit and you pay tax on what you forgot. That's absolutely true. Bookkeeping is not something people like to talk about. It's not exciting. What's exciting, the most exciting thing I discuss with, with our clients is tax planning. That's what they want to talk about. After that comes tax returns because they have to file a return. Whatever whatever comes, they have to do a tax return. And then at the very, very end is bookkeeping. But bookkeeping is indeed important. Most of my clients use QuickBooks Online, although there are other perfectly fine software tools. Some people use Zero, especially, uh, well, not, not in the geography that, that I live in on the East Coast, but on the West Coast more, certainly out of the United States, Zero is popular. But there are tools that you can use. In some cases, you can use Excel, especially if you're in real estate. I don't have a problem with that. But uh, if you have any kind of an operating business, like a, like we said before, if you're an electrician or a plumber or a consultant or accountant or doctor or whatever, you have to have some kind of books. And I personally like to put books online. Uh, use it and make sure you have a clean set of books. Clean means... You know, who owes you money? You know, what bills you paid, who you paid it to. You're going to need to know that when you do 1099s, we, we should mention that. 1099s are due at the end of January. If you paid contractors more than $600 per year, you have to do a 1099. Make sure you go to your accountant or your preparer or whoever it is. Uh, talk about 1099s. And our rule is you don't pay somebody until they give you the 1099, because that's the only time you're going to get them to give you your 1099. Right. So you withhold payment 
so that they have skin in the game to give you that's, the, that's the, a good, that's a good practical piece of advice. Yes. Um, simple stuff. So that's, it's very important. And one thing, Rocky, we should just mention is bank reconciliation. So another very boring topic, but all the bank reconciliation means is that you've checked your books and that they tie to the bank. You know that the money coming in and the money going out, it equals what's in the bank. Somebody should do it once a month, at least once a month or once every couple months. That's how you know that your books are clean. That's, that's just a good piece of practical advice. And I agree with that. There's some new rule that's come out about reporting LLCs and ownership now. Do you know much about that? That's brand, a brand new thing. Uh, it has to do with, um, it's called, uh, I, I can't remember the exact name. It's, it's a brand new rule that just came out very recently. I believe it's effective January 1 of 2024, where you have to report the ownership of businesses. It's just about every business in the United States, including LLCs. So we're going to be sending out information. Uh, anybody who's interested, they can reach out to me, and I'm happy to provide them with information as to how we're all going to be doing it. But it's a new thing we have to comply with. It has to do with ownership of businesses. It's that's not an IRS rule. It's a, it's a. I think it's a Treasury Department rule, but it is something brand new that we have to comply with. The other thing I, of a practical nature, I just want to mention we we haven't really talked about it yet, is tax payments. If you own a business, you have to pay quarterly taxes. Not everybody knows that, but you do. You have to pay quarterly taxes, and that's how you keep on top of your tax burden. Otherwise, you're going to owe a ton of money at the end of the year, and you may not be ready for it, and you'll be subject to interest and penalties. Make sure that either you're doing quarterly taxes or you're taking enough withholding out of your payroll to cover taxes. That's another nice way of doing it. So you don't have to remember to do quarterly taxes. The other thing I tell business owners is if your business profitability has changed, you should have a conversation with your tax prep person every quarter. Because if all of a sudden you're making a lot more money, you might need to make an extra payment. Or if things went south this year, you might be overpaying. And yeah. So right. it's just kind of keeping on top. Of course, there's always the safe harbor. If you pay 110% of last year, you don't have to worry about the, the penalties and interest, correct? That's right. But who wants to be in a situation where you owe a whole bunch of money that, that you can't pay? So it's better to, better to keep up with it throughout the year, stay, stay current, stay on top of it. If anything comes up, the IRS is going to know that, that you're that, that you're a good citizen and, and they can work with you. And that's why we like Profit First, because our tax money is ready and waiting. When tax time comes, we can stroke a check. And even if it's a big check, it's no big deal because the cash is there. So at least we're that's not right. freaking that's out. And that's great. That's kind great of stuff. the key. It's always staying on top of cash flow. What are some of the biggest issues that you see business owners or mistakes that they make in running their business when it comes to finances? Some of them we've already touched on. People who don't pay their taxes currently is a, is a big one. Messy bookkeeping because people hate bookkeeping. And it's not that easy in truth. It's not that easy. The software is not that easy, especially if you have a lot of transactions. You know, people are paying you and Money's going in, money's going out. And the more complicated your business is and the more transactions you have, the more difficult it becomes. You have to stay on, stay on top of it and keep your books clean. That's very important. Those are the important things. And then as, as we've said, with tax planning, there are things you can do throughout the year to reduce taxes, like when you buy equipment, those, those kind of things. So those are the things I would say that are important. Uh, keep on top of it. Be organized. If you make payments, know who you're paying it to. Don't use cash that's that's hard to track. Those kind of things. Simple, basic stuff. If people would like to learn more about you and your firm, what's the best place for them to find you? Sure. So we have a website. It's Massey and Company, CPA.com. Uh, they're welcome to check, check us out there. We have lots of articles on tax planning as well as uh, tax problems. 
and how to solve tax problems and tax returns. So happy to speak with anybody. So they can come to our website. They are welcome to email me. And hopefully you'll, you'll put the email address into the show notes, but it's gary.massey at massieandcompanycpa.com. And or they can always give me a call and my, I'll, I'll give you my, my direct number, which is, uh, 404 660 5905. And, uh, just don't call, try to call, uh, <laughs> not, not late at night, but, uh, so please be respectful of that number. Try to call during the day. And, uh, um, or my, my team and I love working with small business owners. We love helping businesses grow. We are a growing small business ourselves and we like working with small businesses and working with good people and we welcome them to call us. And we'll put that all in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here. I suggest you do tax planning all year long and make sure your books are properly closed out every month. What we didn't talk about is what we do, which is to coordinate all these roles and to take information they provide to help you have a more profitable and cash-flowing business. Because you don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful. Remember to focus on the bottom line. We can help ensure that happens. If you'd like for us to be a part of your profitability journey, we have different programs available ranging from do-it-yourself to one-on-one coaching. Our course, The Profit Blueprint, teaches you everything you need to know to transform your profitability. There are three different tiers ranging from DIY to done with you so that businesses of all sizes can get the support that's best. Join the waitlist in the show notes to get more information and be a part of the next cohort. If you want a done for you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to 10 million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. Remember to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul, where we talk about how to live the ultimate life and be the best business owner you can be. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity. Profit is sanity and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.